Hi everyone, this is the fourth lecture of week five. And, and again, you can listen to this as an audio and please read uh, Genesis 29 before you listen to this lecture. <clears throat> so when we left off, um, Jacob's theft of Esau's blessing so inflamed the family situation that Jacob now had to flee to Aram in Syria. Uh, so back to family, okay? And of course, as we saw, this is, you know, so he, so Jacob has to flee back to family, but of course, as we saw, this is no ordinary family, uh, rather competitive family. Um, so huh, it is, it's not clear whether this is good or bad. After leaving his house <clears throat> by Genesis 29, um, Jacob finds himself in Aram near a well, which as I noted last time is a favorite gathering place for women and a kind of apt symbol of life and fertility because of its connection to water and hence a great place to meet your wife or your spouse, which is what happens to Jacob in probably what is the kind of cutest or most romantic cute in the uh, Hebrew text, okay? We are told that Jacob lands in Aram near a well where shepherds incidentally have gathered. And he asks them, you know, he's talking to the shepherds. He says, hey, do you guys know, do you happen to know my uncle Laban? And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's his daughter coming right now. Oh, and by the way, we're having some problems. This is what the shepherds are saying. Oh, because of this giant stone that is covering the well, if only somebody big and strong and let's say needing to impress someone could would just lift it for us. Okay, at which point this is what happens. Okay, verse nine. While he was still speaking with them, Rachel came <clears throat> with her father's sheep, for she kept them. Now, when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of his mother brother's, uh, mother's brother Laban, and the sheep of his mother's brother Laban, Jacob went up and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of his mother's brother Laban. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and wept aloud. And Jacob told Rachel that he was his father's kinsman and that he was Rebekah's son. And she ran and told her father. Okay. Uh, there, uh, here in a rather romantic scene, Jacob, the younger son, meets the perfect woman for him, his cousin Rachel, uh, the younger daughter of Laban, his uncle, and we are told is immediately smitten. Right? He then shows off what a big, strong guy he is by lifting the stone from the mouth and watering, you know, the flock, okay? This is lots of fertility imagery, okay? Um, as I noted earlier, cross-cousin marriages were seen as entirely appropriate, if not ideal, okay? Uh, because these marriages were distant enough not to be incest, but close enough to keep the resources within the same family, okay? Indeed, Jacob realizes that God has helped him land in exactly the right place and meet the exact right person as he kisses Rachel and weeps in joy or perhaps relief. Okay. Things therefore seem to be looking up for Jacob. Okay. He's come to the right place. He's met the right woman. She's perfect. Okay. Uh, so what more is there to the story, right? You might ask, well, it's, you know, a perfect, uh, you know, a story in which nothing happens and everything works out great for the protagonist would not be such a good story after all, right? Um, and of course, the biblical writers are master storytellers, right? Also remember um, that Jacob has done some bad, bad things back in Canaan, and now it's time to pay, okay? So this is what happens in Genesis 29, verses 16, and the following. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. And Leah's eyes were lovely. Now, you'll find different translations here. Lovely, or soft, or delicate, or weak. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, but Rachel was graceful and beautiful. And Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. And Laban said, is it, it is better that I give her to you than I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Oh, okay. And then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife that I may go into her for my time is completed. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. But in the evening, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. Laban, by the way, also gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her maid. When morning came, and the Hebrew word here is hine, it was Leah. Hine is untranslatable. Okay, and so the best translation here is when morning came, shit, it was Leah. 
And Jacob said to Laban, what is this that you have done to me? <laughs> Did I not serve with you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? And Laban said, this is not done in our country, giving the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one, and we will give you the other awesome return for serving me another seven years. And Jacob did so and completed her week. Then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel as a wife. Laban gave his maid Bilhah to his daughter Rachel to be her maid. So Jacob went into Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah. And he served Laban for another seven years. Okay. Um, having found the perfect woman, indeed, Rachel and Jacob will be portrayed very similarly. They're both tricky, they're rule breaking, they're second born children, they will both, as you'll see, thieve something. Okay. Um, they're so similar that some scholar even calls Rachel or renames Rachel Jacoba, right, because of her similarities to Jacob. Okay, so having found the perfect woman, Jacob immediately makes an agreement with her father, his uncle, um, that he's going to work seven years and that would be payment to make Rachel his wife. Okay, though Laban seems happy with the agreement, emphasizing, you know, Laban says, oh yeah, that's great, you're already family. Okay, remember, again, this is a very particular family. They're very competitive. Okay, and so what Ray, you know, when Laban says, oh, you're, but your family, it's better, you know, it, 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 these are hints that something is going to go awry, okay, and that rivalries, more intra-family rivalries will follow, and indeed they do, right? We are told that Rachel has an older sister named Leah. Now, names are a little weird. Um, Rachel's name means an ew, E W E an animal, you know, a farm animal, okay, whatever. And, uh, Rachel, whose name means you, is described as beautiful in form, okay? Leah, though, again, there's probably a contrast here. Leah, um, her name means a wild cow. You know, this is agricultural, you know, this seems weird, but it's agricultural context, right? Okay, whatever. Um, Leah, whose name means wild cow, is described in Hebrew as having, and now you hit a word that is very difficult to translate. Okay, um, as having lovely eyes, delicate eyes, soft eyes, weak eyes. These are all possible as translations. Okay, so in short, it's unclear whether the description of Leah is positive that she had very delicate, beautiful eyes. Which, you know, if you've ever looked at a cow's eyes, you know, cows have really large, beautiful eyes. Okay, so maybe that's what it's saying. Or some wonder if this description is a lot more negative, um, that it hints that there's something physically wrong with Leia, that Leia, you know, needed, gla needed glasses, so to speak. Okay. Regardless, um, we don't know. Um, uh, it, it is clear, of course, um, that despite whatever it says, right, um, that Leia and Rachel are opposites in contrast, right? That Rachel is the beautiful younger daughter beloved by Jacob. So in contrast, Leia is the opposite, the less comely older sister who will not be loved by her husband. Okay, and again, we have this kind of sibling rivalry. Notice how um, similar the Esau-Jacob rivalry is to the Leah-Rachel rivalry, okay? Um, so, uh, it's, uh, okay, and, and indeed you have, um, what you find in literature is that twins tend to reduplicate, generate more twins, okay? And, and indeed, this is what happened. Jacob and Esau seems to kind of spawn Rachel and Leah. Um, some have even argued that the maidservants that are given to Rachel and Leah, okay, Bil Bilhah and Zilpah, were also twins and also sisters of uh, Rachel and Leah, okay? So at least in Midrash, okay? So lots of twins here. Okay. Um, as before, uh, the sibling rivalry between Leah and Rachel in this case will be heightened by the duplicitous actions of the parent, in this case, their father Laban. After working seven years in order to marry Rachel, we are told that on the night of Jacob's wedding, Laban exchanges Leah for Rachel. And for some reason, Jacob does not recognize um, that the wrong woman is in his tent until morning after the marriage is consummated. Hey, Jacob, okay too, seems to have been blinded, okay, just like his father Isaac earlier when Isaac ended up blessing the wrong son. Some say maybe he was, you know, this was a drinking festival, maybe Jacob was drunk, or maybe, again, there's some divine blindness going on, 
Okay. When Laban is confronted <laughs> by this later by an outraged Jacob, okay, uh, when he discovers he's married the wrong woman, um, this exchange is mysteriously explained by Laban as simply um, not the way things are done here. That in this country, the younger is not put before the firstborn. And Laban says this in verse 26, okay? And it's hard not to see Laban's response as a kind of zinger, okay? A reference back to the earlier mistreatment and misdeed of Esau by Jacob and his mother. Many interpreters see Laban's response as narrative comeuppance for Jacob's earlier dupe of his blind father Isaac to obtain the Esau's blessing. This earlier theft constituted an instance in which Isaac was deceived by Jacob to put the younger, that is Jacob, before the older, that is Esau. This narrative in Genesis 29 corrects that and punishes Jacob by putting the older, Leah, before the younger, Rachel. Okay. Um, because of this narrative correction, we are told that Jacob works uh, another seven years uh, for Laban in order to marry Rachel, whom the text emphasizes he loved more than Leah in verse 30. Okay. And notice a portrayal of Laban who like Jacob and perhaps like Rebecca is not above thieving family members to get ahead. Okay. And notice how at the end of this, you know, Laban, you know, with Laban and Jacob, you get this kind of trickster versus trickster narrative. Okay. Laban so far is the winner here because he's gotten 14 free years of service. Okay. From Jacob. Needless to say, um, the, the father's, you know, Laban's deceptive exchange during the wedding night, which causes Rachel and Leah to end up becoming wives to the same man. Um, this exacerbates the rivalrous relationship of the sisters who are already compared and contrasted in the text. Married to the same person, these sisters, these competitive sisters, now have the misfortune of being rivalrous wives who have to compete with each other for family status and for the love and regard of the same man. Indeed, um, however, in contrast to Jacob and Esau, for whatever weird reason, God, however, gets right into the middle of Rachel and Leah's rivalry. Okay? And, and, and God doesn't do this with uh, Esau and Jacob. Okay? In Genesis 29, verse 31, it states that, quote, when the Lord saw that, Rachel, that, that Leah was unloved, when the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her, her womb but Rachel was barren. Okay. So it's very strange here. Why does God get in the middle of this rivalry when he didn't get in the middle of the previous rivalry? You know, is it because this God is particularly interested in babies? He is, okay. Um, but why punish Rachel because she is loved? Is it bad to be loved, okay? Um, is God simply trying to level the playing field? Okay, again, nothing is very clear, right? The text just kind of raises these questions. Um, whatever the reason for the divine interference, um, if we kind of look at the text through the view of the kind of female characters, okay, um, of course what we realize is they are put into an impossible situation. The deceptive manner in which Laban compelled Jacob to marry the older, less regarded Leah leaves her in a loveless marriage with the husband who never wanted to marry her in the first place not just Leah, but Laban's duplicitous actions for which she gained another seven years of free labor from Jacob will also hurt his other daughter, Rachel, okay, who also has her own difficulties. Though Rachel is prettier, beloved, and desired by her husband, she, however, has trouble getting pregnant, in part because, you know, there's hints that because God butts in. By heightening Leah's reproductive abilities, God exacerbates. So it's not just Laban. Notice how God also heightens rivalries, right? Exacerbates the competition between these sibling wives, okay? As he did maybe earlier with Cain and Abel. Um, and this kind of heightening of rivalries where now the family has to compete with each other, right? As well as the offenses done in the midst of these competitions, this will reverberate throughout the Genesis text.